So we're uh, very close here to go live to uh, Phoenix with uh, Aniko with a uh, interview with State Representative Juan Mendez um, at the Net Roots Conference. Very excited to, to talk to him about his agenda and uh, what he's been doing in the state. And recently, the one of the big uh, Supreme Court decisions was regarding Arizona's lawsuit. Okay. We're live. Uh, uh, sued. Uh, the IRC, the Independent uh, Redistricting Committee, um, for what they were trying to do. And of course, SCOTUS uh, found that the IRC was totally valid, that uh, they could redistrict uh, independently. And I see that, uh, and, and Nico, you have someone there with you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi, world. I am sitting here with Representative Juan Mendez, and uh, we're ready for an interview. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good and morning. basically we want to talk about a variety of things. Uh, basically it's an open conversation That's and great. it's going out to the world right now. That's so great. yeah, for, um, Bernie 2016 TV is a grassroots volunteer effort to kind of push Bernie um, to the presidency. This is great. So, we got to be creating as much content as we can. Absolutely. And you're a supporter. Yes. Yeah. Early on. I mean, I've, uh, he's one of my favorite uh, senators. Going forward, uh, and it was the person I always wished would run for office. Uh, so, and I'm so happy that he's doing it now. That's awesome. Yeah. Go ahead and that in. Oh, oh, that's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, um, if we have a, if we have questions from the audience later on, you can maybe answer those. I'd love but, to. Yeah. Um, basically, I just kind of want to talk to you about um, what brought you to discover Bernie Sanders and. Uh, why you're supporting him? What kind of issues um, you feel you guys have in common? Because I know there's a lot. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm in it way more for the for the long run. There's I mean I love his the ten point or fifteen point whatever plan he's put on put mm -hmm. online. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, it's great that the first thing on it is spending on an, an infrastructure. Uh, I mean it's something that I think for sure on a on a big picture macroeconomic level that's something that needs to be happening. Uh, that'll and that is the kind of thing that'll end up trickling down to affecting all of us in all different kinds of ways, like in all the different. Uh, circles of your life uh, kind of deal but uh, for sure I am in it because I trust him to envision a different way for us to be doing everything politically um, I without corporate, control, without, right? without corporate control yeah uh, I mean I mean I'm interested in for what democracy might actually look like if we wanted to practice it uh, I, I feel we don't have uh, a lot of uh, leaders who, who have that kind of interest in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I know we have a lot more potential in terms of what we're doing uh, on, on the level of what democracy is. Mm -hmm. and, and it just makes it look like a whole better world with yeah. Bernie running for president. He's got a great vision. Yeah. And I, I don't want to live in a country where we're controlled by corporate interests and our leaders are bought off and Bernie is not. Um, and so I definitely, when I discovered him and I started listening to his speeches, I just couldn't get away from it. So, yeah. Um, and what about immigration? I know Arizona is really important on that issue, and um, we're border state, so yeah. there's a lot of stuff going on here, and that conversation needs to be had. Um, Trump was just here, and um, the kinds of things he says, you know, derogatory things and insulting things, um, you know, that's not that's not what we want our political discourse to be like. And Bernie Sanders yeah. is bringing that to kind of a sensible level. For sure, yeah, because, I mean, there's a lot of um, of this conversation. I mean, some people want to take it in certain angles or certain areas, but we have, there's a lot that we have to rise above if... If we're uh, if we're attempting to to solve a lot of these uh, issues, uh, especially in a in a more um, respectful and, and humanitarian way, mm -hmm. at least in, in in ways that acknowledge what the true problems are, because uh, I mean I'm I'm pretty sure Bernie is on the same page in that uh, a lot of our immigration issues settle or come from our trade uh, agreements, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and and so we can't uh, we can't look at this problem as if we're not part of the problem. I mean, uh, the world is kind of globalizing now, and um, even people in other countries are having uh, Bernie meetups and, you know, kind of cheering him on because they can see that America should be a leader in the world and we shouldn't be falling behind on uh, things such as education um, and health care. Bernie yeah. con constantly brings up the fact that we are behind um, the civilized world <laughs> in providing free education to, or free uh, healthcare, sorry, to uh, the public, and actually free education too. If someone wants education, they should be able to 
get it. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, especially uh, around the access to healthcare. I mean, it's an another one of those things that economically is going to be pushing a lot of us forward. I mean, again, as uh, I know there's, um, there were so many uh, Latinos that were able to take advantage of, of healthcare uh, in, with this last run with uh, access on the affordable healthcare uh, plans, and, and that's done so much for our economy. There were so, there were so many people who were not accessing healthcare who are now doing it, and, and the ripple effects they're having on the economy are so, uh, and, and on our, that, that help everybody in the sense that it's bringing down the price for healthcare for everybody else. Yeah, it's more efficient, right? Yeah. I mean, if everybody has to contribute to the pool, then there's going to be more money available. There's cost savings so, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and people were doubting its efficiency, and it's actually better than projected, right? Yep. So um, once we get to the point where Bernie wants to go, which is universal health care, that's kind of the next step forward. So, so it's um, only going to be able to get better. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's absolutely what we want. And uh, uh, what do you think of, um, I have read that Bernie wants to uh, audit the Fed. And that's actually a common ground between groups that don't like Bernie, um, you know, the right and the libertarians, you know, maybe they can find some common ground and can bring some to bring some other people to our side. And you know, help that's so that's where we have the biggest potential uh, is in that uh, I think the the right is going to be surprised with how often um, other ideologies will fall in line with uh, with, with what. Bernie wants to do, mm -hmm. uh, and and there's going to be a lot of potential for us to coordinate with people, to organize with other with other groups. Uh, I mean, it, it's it, and especially around the Fed. I mean, everybody wants to be talking about that, and that's and Bernie is somebody that I would trust uh, to take on that, that kind of issue. There's other there's other people where if I heard that that was going to be happening, I wouldn't expect much out of it. Uh, and then I mean, we're all getting excited right now for Bernie, but I imagine everyone's still. Uh, or a lot of people are thinking, you know, like, who is he going to be picking to be working with as he's going up along with this from everybody from, you know, like, who is his vice president pick going to be to who else is going to be in his cabinet. And there's, with Bernie uh, making those kind of decisions, I mean, it's like setting up a dream team for, like, a sports team kind of thing. Like, the potential is, uh, the potential for the shift that we're going to have in this next election is going to be huge. And that's why it's more, it's so much more important. Like, I mean, people have been telling me that Bernie's campaign has been able to collect the most donations uh, for, for the presidential, smaller, smaller donations, Democrat or Republican, Bernie's uh, been collecting more, and that's a lot of potential, but it's something that I hope we don't waste, like we need to be organizing now uh, to, to be able to take advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. He has, I think it's $43, this is the average donation, um, whereas you know, Hillary's taking corporate money, all of the people on the right are taking corporate money, and Bernie's kind of adamant about not taking that because then, you know, he would have to serve their interest. Well, and then, I mean, like, elections on themselves have just gotten way too out of control with how much money they take in and how much money they spend. I mean, I've been, I've ran two of my own campaigns, and I've worked on a lot of campaigns. People find very interesting ways to spend money that doesn't need to be spent. I mean, like, what we're trying to do and how we're trying to activate people, it'll be a lot more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, I mean, we're going to rely less and less on, uh, on the traditional methods of reaching voters, and we're going to put time into actually organizing the communities. Awesome. And that's actually exactly what we're doing here. Um, we kind of have a grassroots effort where everybody around the, United, around the United States is providing their talent, their skill, their passion, and for free, all volunteer to push Bernie, because we all know that we can live in a better world when um, we don't have people who are trying to suppress the vote, trying to take away health care, trying to take away education, and also LGBT rights. The Supreme Court just voted, um, you know, that uh, for marriage equality, and it's actually, like Bernie says, it's hard to believe that there are still so many people stuck in the dark ages when it comes to equality. Well, I mean, there's a lot going on still in, in our communities right now where there's uh, cities that don't have protections in, in terms of, uh, you know, being able to be fired from your job or, uh, you know, certain health care or, you know, um, relationship rights and things like that. Uh, we're going to we're gonna be making a lot of big pushes uh, to, to ch make those changes in, in our communities. And it's, it's, it's important that we take advantage of the wave that we're going to have from Bernie. Like, we need to be organizing around all the issues that we care about. It's not just that this is a presidential election and that's why we need you to organize. Uh, like, if you have an interest and you want it to be at the forefront, we need to start building it now. 
so that it's there and that we take advantage of it later on. And don't don't just watch people do it. Go and do it yourself. And this is my first time doing this, so that's what I'm talking about. I love you know, find a representative in your state. <laughs> Actually, you are not abundant in Arizona. You, I don't know how many legislators will find to support Bernie in this red state. So I'm sure he's really glad to have uh, you. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start working on everybody. And Nico, um, is that are we getting? Is this an endorsement from uh, Representative Mendez of Bernie? Is he officially? Oh, yeah, I, I would, I would. Uh, I guess I haven't really signed anything. Uh, the the campaign in uh, in Phoenix is just getting started. Uh, I, I don't think we've had our first um, organizational meeting, but I know the Progressive Democrats for for America have started organizing um, in, in the background to anticipate uh, the campaign people getting here. So I mean, I've been involved in some of the first meetings, and I is no one's asked me yet, but I love to just you know give my my endorsement on my own that I yeah I'm endorsing Bernie Sanders for president. Uh, great news, uh, Representative uh, Mendez, Dave Conan here, Bernie 2016 TV in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Hi, I have a question. Hi. Um, yeah. With regards to the um, uh, Supreme Court decision, we had a number of them last month, and some yeah. more important than others. And I think actually one of the most important ones was the decision regarding your state and your legislature. And, uh, suing the Independent Commission on Redistricting, and of course the IRC won. Could you comment on that? And also, Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for that question. You have to finish. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, please. Yeah, comment on that, please. And also, uh, talk about what you're doing. I know one of your big issues is voter suppression and voters' rights and what you're doing to expand the vote uh, for progressives there in Arizona. Yeah. Um, so, again, thank you for the question. I had so – I would stressed so much about this issue – and, and it was only made worse by the fact that I feel like the news didn't really highlight this uh, congressional – or I mean this Supreme Court decision. Uh, like I was starved for, for commentary on, on this issue. Like so much about my uh, – um, I mean not just my political aspirations, but like all of the organizing I had been doing at the state level, um, all the relationships I had been building with, uh, with everybody around me was up for, for – for change and and we didn't really talk about what the impact it would have uh, and I mean and, and again my state is my own um, but uh, this uh, decision also would have, would have affected California and, and California if they would have had to redrawn their congressional lines just for how many congressional members California has it would have been a rewriting of a huge percentage of of, of Congress um, and and so we would have we would have been part of that and and it's uh, it would have been a real big hit to to what we had been doing in in, in Arizona. Uh, like, um, I, I can I can see how sometimes Arizona can easily get written off as a as a red state. Um, but there had been time where out of out of nine congressional members, we had uh, the Democrats had five of them, uh, and so we had been doing a lot of organizing. There, we, we had uh, benefited from uh, this independent redistricting commission where the long lines were being drawn fairer and fairer every, every 10 years after the census. Uh, and, and with those opportunities, we were making, you know, we weren't wasting those opportunities. We were organizing people. We were finding candidates to run at, at all the different levels. Uh, so we had been putting a lot of work in. I mean, and I had gotten, I had become, you know, um, introduced into politics while everybody was working on, on, on making these huge gains. And so I don't, I'd only ever known my community as, you know, in this mode, right, in this gear, uh, and to, I mean, like, it, 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 it robbed me of sleep thinking about how much we would have to change or what, what would change. Uh, there, there was a long time where I didn't even think about this. Like, I chose to avoid thinking about it because, I mean, it felt so much out of my control, and it, and it was so um, uh, Orwellian in that it was coming down to a definition of a word, and and everybody was fighting over what the legislature meant. Like as how, like how do you define the legislature? And and I just felt it felt so um, cheap that, that that's what they were going to run on on just being like no let's let's limit and narrow the idea of what a legislature is so that we can take advantage of a technicality. Yeah. Well, uh, it was and it the, just, that was the same thing with the Affordable Care Act too. It was all about a word in one paragraph and the. The, the uh, intention of the law versus the actual letter of the law. Yeah, I mean, so it says a lot about what uh, what the rights game plan is is uh, is built up on, uh, and, and 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 a lot of these things, you know, like in the news, they can play out like if it's just happening out of nowhere. I mean, I mean, I mean, I imagine a lot of people don't even know what the Supreme Court schedule is, and and then you know just think this news was just safe for like all of this, you know, this last month or whatever. Um, but it is. 
I mean, it's just interesting that uh, all this was set up at the same time. And I mean, it, and it just made it worse that that was one of the later ones that came out. And so I was, you know, there was good news after good news after good news that I was just scared that this was going to be the one to where, you know, like they, they, they were like, oh, we didn't care about those ones. You know, we we're, really wanted this one. And now they're going to be able to change so much about uh, about how the maps were drawn that it was it was one of the scariest ones. Uh, well, and so, I think it's, it's got to be, it's, it's, uh, as far as a decision goes, in our democracy, it's, it's one of the most crucial decisions the Supreme Court has made. Yeah, um, and, well, and then, uh, I mean, there's one that's kind of like along the lines of this, or at least in the same realm, that's going to be come up next year, right? Like, uh, I think I, I didn't read enough about it, but up the idea where they want to change, you know, where your districts are made off of how many people vote in them versus mm -hmm. how many people live in them. I don't know if that's... I might be misrepresenting that issue, but I know there's something else coming up. Like, we're not out of the... Like, there are still more and more uh, attempts at these kinds of control at, at, at this level. Um, well, when but you, can, when you talking, can't win an election on the issues, you have to cheat, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, and, and gerrymandering is not anything that's new. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm actually scared to think... that. I mean, like, I've only... Uh, experienced Arizona politics. I I don't know what it would be like to grow up in a state that allowed their legislature to draw their congressional lines. Uh, like I I can imagine that makes it a little bit more jaded. Uh, or I mean, like a system that I mean, when you grow up in, it doesn't sound fair. Um, I, I didn't know that I was benefiting from such a, a progressive um, um, opportunity or a progressive look at uh, how democracy should play out, too. But uh, you had asked about other things that we have to, to, to de deal with or, or, or put up in, uh, in in Arizona. And there's been a lot of um, um, a lot of unique things and a lot of things that have been happening all over the state, uh, I mean, all, all over the country. One that I, uh, I mean, I, I'd love to share with you all right now is um, there had been, and it's not just recent. It's been happening uh, for the last um, couple of sessions, but we, uh, another thing that I kind of feel like is, is unique when I think about organizing versus in Arizona versus other states is, is we're kind of, I mean, people make fun of our, our heat a lot, but we're blessed with a lot of time during the year where we get to go out and knock on doors and talk to voters. Uh, and it, I mean, I know it's made me a whole different kind of politician, I, I would like to think, is that, uh, I mean, I'm not only dependent on, on, uh, uh, like I don't have to raise money to, to run for office. I get to just knock to knock on doors and talk to voters, and and they help me get elected. Um, but um, so we also have the ability to to uh, we have mail-in ballots, right, where people get sent their ballot 30 days before an election, uh, and they have their time to take to fill it out, research everything. If they want to, they can put it back in the mail. Or, or they can take it and drop it off somewhere. Uh, it's it's amazing uh, that it, I mean that we give you that much time to, to think about the decisions you're going to be make, making. Uh, and again, it's one of the things that I kind of always took for granted that we have this time to, to think. Um, but uh, it's also convenient in the sense that you don't have to be the person to deliver it. Uh, so we built a lot of trust in our in our communities where not our volunteers have relationships with our voters, and so they'll go door to door. You know, asking people if they've gotten their ballot yet, and if they've returned it, and, and if they would like us to return it for them. Uh, and so we've we've made a habit out of collecting thousands and thousands of ballots. Um, and we, you know, they're already filled out, they're sealed, they're they're uh, they're um, they would have been they would have I mean, you don't have to waste money on a stamp, but I mean, they would have been put it in the, in the in the mail. But we take it in for them. And sometimes it's really important for a lot of people will hold on to their ballots the day uh, in, until the very last day. Uh, and well, you can't put it in the mail all of a sudden at that point, at that point anymore. So we take it for them and we turn it in. Um, and so we're making sure that a lot of people get to vote who might not have had a chance to vote. Uh, but there's been this organized effort to to make that um, that assistance seem like it's uh, the worst thing to happen to dem to democracy. Uh, they make it sound like we're tearing down uh, democracy by picking up people's ballots. Like we're gonna. We're going to erode the the trust that is democracy by by helping somebody to deliver the ballots, and and there've been multiple efforts to make that illegal. Uh, yeah. They and then they they go out of there. I mean, I wouldn't say they go out of their way, but they. Oh, I imagine people have fun coming up with all kinds of ways to name what's going on, but they call it ballot harvesting. Uh, like if we're like if we're running around in fields and just taking people's ballots. Um, but it began. I mean, it's not a. A stranger wouldn't just hand over a stranger a ballot. These people have, I mean, like I, I know when I grew up as a volunteer doing these kinds of things, 
I've been knocking in my neighborhood for six six years. Yeah, so so they know who they're giving a balance to. Um, but so they're 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 trying to um, stem our efforts to bring out people to vote on all different kinds of angles. Um, and so attacking the way that we organize, you know, putting up barriers in terms of having to have an ID in, in, order, in order to vote. Um, there's constant, um, uh, w we spend so much money trying to uh, appease their their fears of, uh, of people make uh, voting when they shouldn't be voting that we um, like we we have two different ballots in, in Arizona there's a state ballot and a federal ballot and and it's you know we, we it's there to make them happy and we waste so much money printing two different ballots that it's ridiculous representative Mendez, we have a question from one of our other correspondents uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Lawrence Kansas uh, from Bernie Cass Ryan come on hi Hey, Representative Mendes, I'm Ryan with Bernie Cast, and uh, I've you've been saying so many good things that I have a, a few questions I really want to ask you. The first one yeah, for sure. is, being from Kansas, we have a, a Secretary of State uh, who is really doing all that he can to suppress the vote, and there are a lot of really, really bad things happening in this state in order to disenfranchise people. Um, yeah. As a young representative, as somebody who's already in the thick of some of these issues with the gerrymandering and those sort of things, I'm wondering if you could give us any idea about how you would recommend people go about addressing voter problems in their own states, including Arizona. Um, well, for, for sure, I mean, a lot of the there's there's groundwork that needs to be done before you we attempt to to take on any any of this kind of thing. So um, for sure, educating yourself on on what's going on. Uh, I mean, I would even, even kind of advocate some kind of triage in the sense of making sure um, not just picking the issue that that you're comfortable with, but picking the issue that's that's going to be coming up first. That's going to be uh, that's going to have the, the biggest impact. Um, but um, I, I mean there. I, I mean, I, I can't speak to Kansas, but if if Arizona is anything of an example, there there is somebody that's that's trying to organize around this anyway uh, already. So it's not going to be like you're, you're you're alone. So you're not yeah you're not inventing the wheel kind of thing. Um, like uh, every state has all different organizations where I mean, like it's common cause or you know like it's an advocacy uh, group. Somebody is aware of, of what's going on, and, and they're trying to, to organize around it. But it, it's going to be just be honest, like communication with with voters. Um, I mean, it's it's going to be uh, the the only time the news is going to start using our language is when they hear us using it. Um, they're they're not going to just have an epiphany and and start framing the news differently about what's going on with voter suppression. Absolutely. And, yeah, so we have to, we have to we have to leave it to where they have no choice. We have to make it to where they feel they're losing out on viewership if they're not using our framing, um, yeah. and and that's only going to happen when um, when it's like top to bottom everybody is coordinated. So uh, I mean, it, it's while it's one thing that we have these great organizations like in Arizona, you know, the Arizona Advocacy uh, Network or, or Center, uh, and, and they're amazing people, and, and they do a lot of organizing, but the more and more that we get that uh, message down to the voter, uh, the more and more that the news will start reporting on how we're uh, taking on the issues. And that's what, that's what uh, we're talking about with this political revolution. It's going to take from the ground up Making, bringing these issues to the forefront to get them addressed by not only the mainstream media, but by politicians themselves. Um, and I guess switching gears a little bit, another question that I saw come through in the chat that I think that you would uh, really, really like to hear from you is what part of Bernie's platform do you identify with the strongest? Uh, I per personally like what I'm what I'm glad it is is there and what I what motivates me in, in the long run is is a lot of the, the in 
environmentalism r r respect and, and, and approach. Uh, I know he's going to have a, a lot of concerns for, for how we're we're um, um, able to grow at the growth rate that we that we are right now. Um, and and he has the kind of head on his shoulders where he's going to uh, not going to just cut corners and and I mean yes there is this prosperity that we all w want to reach but there there's a way to go about it that makes it to where it's much more um, um, <clears throat> where everybody can take advantage of it where um, I mean I don't want to just reduce it to being fair but I mean fair in terms of um, well, we're, we're not we're not making somebody else or, or the environment more fragile at, at you know at our benefits uh, and there's only a limited amount of resources, right? So we have to make sure that we preserve what we can of our plants. So that, and Bernie Sanders said, you know, I have family value. Did you hear that speech yeah. about where he was like, well, it's not a family value to destroy the environment that you're going to lease your grandkids, right? Exactly. So, and all these people are denying what the scientists are telling us, and that is that uh, human activity is, you know, changing the climate. We need to do something about that. And I don't think there's really any other any other candidate that's going to do as much about it as Bernie Sanders would. Right, and and again, I'm thinking in the long run because again, as an environmentalist, I'm still, I, I still think of it as a smart thing that his his still his first thing is planning on infrastructure, mm -hmm. like. For, for for me to ask you to care about the environment the way that I care about the environment, I know that you're going to have to be a lot more stable. You're going to have to have a lot more um, um, not just stability but resilience in your in your in your community. Uh, you're going to have to have a lot more. Uh, and, and I guess I'm all, I'm also recognizing in the long run that for for us to have a healthy economy, it's going to have to be sustainable in in a lot of kind of ways from an environmental point of view. So I mean, we're going to win in the long run. Yeah, and I mean that's one of the first steps is to change the infrastructure. You can't keep building the same kinds of things and doing mining and oil rigging. And but actually, I wanted to say Oak Flat is one of the things that people are outraged about here in Arizona because we have an amazing um, area where uh, there's pristine uh, landscape. Um, it is historical American, Native American land. Yeah, that sacred in, in sacred all, land, all kinds of ways. And they just gave it away to a <laughs> mining company. So we're out I actually, if I, can, if I can jump in, Nico, I wanted What's to that? add, you, you, brought that, you brought up the uh, Native Americans, and I know uh, the representative, a, a large uh, part of your constituency is indigenous peoples. Uh, what is yeah, there the in Salt River, the Maricopa Indian community. What is their involvement in the political? What is their involvement in the political process? And uh, are, you, are you finding them to be more, uh, more, more interested in the in getting getting active? I, I mean, they're they're very well organized. They're they uh, they're there to. I mean, they hold up many roles and responsibilities in terms of you know. I mean, they're a whole sovereign nation. Uh, so I mean, they have their their game together. They have vision. They have goals. they and they're they're accomplishing a, a lot. And and especially from you know, uh, I, I feel like I've seen the different nations around the valley grow up in just my small. I mean, you know, I'm only 30 years old, and I've I've seen so much change um, all, all all over the states. And and I know that they're they're their own player. And 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 it's really I, it's I love following their politics in that it's a little. I don't want to say. I mean, I like it's it, interesting in its own way. Like they got their own pl um, different dynamics, and that uh, their a lot of their government issues overlay over different states, overlay over so many different cities, uh, and they have relationships with all of them at all different levels. Um, I, I've loved working with them. I've loved uh, you know getting to know their um, their industries more, getting to know uh, the services they provide. Uh, you know, I've helped out with their uh, youth organizations. So. I've, I mean, they've they've been involved a lot, and and I know they want more and more, you know, um, c connection and, and connectivity between between our communities. Uh, I, I I'm looking forward to when they start running more and more um, people for office in in our in, our, in, our, in okay. all levels of government. Both both of the Latino community in Arizona and the Native American community, um, they basically are kind of taken advantage of by the fact that, by the fact that our prison systems need reform. There's, they're channeling people into uh, the system that don't need to be there, um, that are nonviolent people, and being categorized as something that they're not. And um, so we need to change the way the prison system is here in Arizona too, right? 
um, what, what's your opinion about uh, Arpaio and the prison system? Uh, well, um, I mean, it's an interesting, I mean, for sure. Uh, I mean, I know where I stand. Like, this is not the way that I would be organizing society. This is not the way that, I mean, we should be approaching what criminal justice is. Um, the, I mean, we're setting a very, very bad example. But at the same time, like, I like I grew up in this kind of, you know, fear, this kind of, this it's op this open hatred, like this this uh, this demonizing of, of um, ethnicities, and and for sure it shaped me in, in in all kinds of ways. Like I mean, I I am the kind of person I am because of the way that you know Sheriff Joe or the way that I imagine he's patrolling around our, our communities. Like I I he's definitely painted how I view police in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very negative way. So, I mean, at the, at the same time, he's done a lot of us a, di a disservice, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it changes the way that we view and, and value what a prison system is to a society. Like, uh, the, the idea that it is an institution, and then it's serving us all a function. It's not just somewhere where we put somebody in time out. Like, it's, it, it was meant to be helping uh, society stay alive. Uh, kind of thing. But, I mean, I mean we do it all wrong. Um... I forgot what the actual question was. Well, oh, I mean, yeah, uh, so how, how it hurts us all, though, like the way that we approach the prison system, especially with, uh, I mean, with the immigration population and, 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 and Latinos, um, it's made us all less safe. Uh, we all lose out because of people like Sheriff Joe. Uh, the, in, um, in my county, in, in, in Maricopa County, uh, Latinos, undocumented or, or documented, are 50% less likely to call the police if they're a victim or a witness to a crime. Uh, well, and, and then so that means there is no, um, um, well, uh, but it, there is no police um, public safety. There is no public safety if nobody's calling the police. And so if, if I live in a community that is predominantly Latino, and over 50% of them are not calling the police. And a lot of it is because everybody, uh, I mean, I'm a mixed status family. So many people live in mixed statuses where where you, you don't have the same comfort calling the police. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm curious, in Arizona especially, uh, but also across the United States, you know, the demographics are changing. Um, you know, the it less and less is an idea of there's a... There's a uh, majority that's just white, and then you know these other demographics are minorities. We're moving toward a more uh, my minority as a majority nation, and so I'm curious. There in Arizona, uh, are you seeing like you talked about the Latino community uh, not necessarily reporting crimes uh, as much as they maybe should be? I'm curious that. If you've seen them getting involved politically um, to make changes in their communities, and also I'm right. curious what you think their influence will be going into the national election and also just in local elections. Yeah. Um, so so before uh, um, I talk about their their involvement in, in everywhere else, I, I also want to voice concern for the idea that if if they're not engaging with the police in terms of public safety, I'm I am very concerned for what else, what other parts of our society they're not engaging in. Like what else have Absolutely. we have we scared people away from from reaching out to? Uh, and, and and there's a lot of work that we're doing to to repair that uh, that, that the Latino community is is doing themselves, and and they deserve a lot of um, um, recognition uh, for for I mean for having to deal. And come up and grow up in, in this kind of uh, you know community or, or society, uh, especially here in, in in Arizona. But they are for sure organizing and mobilizing themselves. Like um, what I saw come out of what the the, the Dreamers are organizing themselves and and how uh, how far reached those leaders have, have gotten. Like they're uh, you know they organized themselves in the beginning and now they are leading organizations. Now they are um, um, organizing other people uh, and and for sure we've. Um, um, I, I know I have in uh, other political campaigns, not just candidate campaigns, but issue campaigns, uh, have uh, reached out and identified these these um, 
these Latino uh, leaders, young and, and you know all, all different generations, um, and we've given them you know positions of, of power. We've given them um, roles and responsibilities. Like they're they're in charge of their own of their own movement of, of organizing themselves themselves in their community, um, and and we rely on them now for you know initiative drives. Um, we rely on them to to organize everybody too, and not just their own communities. Uh, we've given them you know. Um, Free reign to organize around the whole the whole valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, curious. Lisa, uh, of an undocumented college student who basically, like you said, you know, you don't you want don't want to live your life looking over your shoulder to see if somebody's gonna say, okay, you know, get out of here. You're, but I mean, and, and, and these are these are scary. I mean, uh, I've learned how to talk about this as, as as adverse childhood experiences, right? So these these people are, I mean, these children are growing up. When seeing their parents leave for work and and not being guaranteed that their parents are going to come back, uh, or, be, or be or be there when they get back, uh, and it's I mean it's it's uh, I, I I'm grateful for all the people that have been faced with that kind of uh, situation and have decided to to, to change, um, but uh, but again I mean we're it's a very fragile situation and 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 we're losing lots of people. Who who are, who are going to turn away from from our society, and that's that's I mean, a, a lot of things can motivate me to be engaged in, on these issues. My I mean, my family, my friends for sure. I mean, I, I've had my my uncles been been deported, and and it's rocks my whole family. Like it affects everybody from economic strains to just different strains on on our dynamics of the family who's still here and how do we support people down there um, but uh, uh, um, and I'm lucky that for me it's pushed me to, to do something about it but uh, we, we can't afford to lose people we can't afford for them to turn away from society because they're not gonna leave they're gonna stay here and they're gonna raise families and it's gonna be people more people who are disconnected and disillusioned you know what? Uh, I mean same with um the healthcare. They they're scared to call the police because they are afraid of you know getting deport getting deported. Then you know what's to say they're not scared to go to the doctor when they need to go to the doctor, which means yeah. they're not going to go to the doctor, and then our society is going to be less. Well, and then and then what's worse? Uh, and I'm I'm dealing with this locally right but right now. I just got off this issue. I mean, and we're we're not done. But there's the other part where um, employers will will, will abuse um, a, a, a lot of these un, undocumented workers, and 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 then which that hurts everybody else in the job economy. When 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 we, when we allow employer employers to take advantage of, of cheap labor, it, it hurts everybody else. Um, but and and then and then so they're you know they're uh, working in in horrible working conditions, and and they're afraid to stand up. But I just had um, a ton of um, hotel workers in, in my district who were just fed up and, and were done with it. They went on a, on a I joined them on a, on a two-day hunger strike uh, to, 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 to highlight how awful the working conditions are and, and how they're taken advantage of because of because of their situations. Uh, employers are, are basically not acknowledging the value of labor. Basically. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. About something too. I'm sorry to inter interject. It's kind of hard to hear sometimes. But uh, the we were talking about parents, you know, leaving and not being sure if they're coming home, especially in these communities where there's the possibility of deportation or um, or we talked about earlier incarceration. And I wanted to speak to you about that, just personal experience. Uh, I helped teach preschool for a while, and one thing that, and it was in these uh, low-income communities, and there were so many stories of that happening. Like, you know, the a parent doesn't come home because of some trumped-up, you know, drug offense or something like that, and it has a significant impact on the local community when there's that kind of disconnect between the uh, people and those who are in positions of power. Um, I'm curious what you are, what's being done in Arizona right now or what you're trying to do to address those problems. And then um, secondly, I'm wondering if events like NetMeet this weekend have any effect on uh, the conversation down there and what impact you think might come out of this event. Okay, so for for sure, I mean, the, I've been to a couple of the panels uh, at Netbridge Nation, and, and they've highlighted a lot of uh, the trials that we have to go through in Arizona 
they've uh, communicated a lot about what's going on, and, and I feel like they've done, and there was a lot of audience interaction too. So, I mean, the, the Netroot's helping us get these stories and issues out across the country is going to be, or in the world too, is going to be amazing, and we're going to benefit from that in, in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, I'm always, everybody I'm, I'm talking to, I'm stopping and telling them that they, they need to be looking at Arizona the way that we used to view the South during the civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, like, this is, a, I mean, not just because this is an opportunity to make change, but, I mean, this is the level that we're working at. This is, I mean, we have the same things at stake. Um, we're... we're um, so there's there's a lot of potential, but um, you also asked about. Um, I feel like I answered the last question and I missed your first question. Uh, Netroots. Netroots. How is Netroots uh, the, the, the conference itself? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, so for sure, like I, uh, they, they've let us highlight a lot of issues. The work, the panels that I've been, that I've been to uh, have been great. Uh, I mean, and then it's a lot of tools they've been giving us too about how to to make sure that we engage uh, uh, the Latino community engages the Latino media um, or in traditional or. Uh, What's, whatever it's when it's not Latino media, the regular media, media, yeah. um, mainstream, mainstream uh, media. Uh, I mean, so th there's all kinds of tools that, that I'm going to be leading with. There's all kinds of relationships that I'm going to be leading with. I mean, I'm, uh, I, we're benefiting from the fact that you guys have attracted a lot of awesome people from all over the country to come here. Uh, so, I mean, I've been able to meet up with uh, all different uh, organizations, too, that I Weren't, that I didn't know they were carrying certain causes or that I didn't know they were organized. It, it's a it's a great gathering. I mean, and we get to show other people our issues too. So like, I mean, like and all over the booths were, were local issues going on. Like that Oak Flats issue had a table at, 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 at the booth. At, at the booth. So that was that was awesome. And, and I was able to connect them with uh, with some of the other people too. Um, so. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's. It's scary because they they uh, they overstepped you know the traditional checks right like the, it over it hasn't gone through any EPA um, um, oversight and I mean I, I don't think I'm pretty sure it wasn't really done at all in respect to the Apache Nation uh, like I'm pretty sure there's a different process it should have gone under for, for that kind of deal um, but uh, I mean overall we're gonna benefit from Netroots Nation being here I mean and, and it helps us call out everybody else. Like I'm, I'm glad Netroots Nation didn't skip Phoenix. Uh, I mean, we like how I'm saying, like we need your help to to, to highlight this. Otherwise, um, I mean, if we don't bring people from out of out of out of the state to to point and to help highlight what's going on, the people here are gonna think that they're just normal and that they're what what they're doing is right. Um, yeah, we gotta call them out. And the thing is, there's I'm sure you know that Bernie had to change the the venue three twice now because the past year was originally at the Hyatt, then it was moved to Comerica, seating 5,000. That wasn't enough in Arizona for Bernie. So 10,000 people at, uh, are going to be watching Bernie. So it's, there's a lot of people here that kind of don't come out until an event like this happens. Maybe they see, okay, I'm in a sea of conservatives here, and I'm, I'm alone here. But we're not alone here. There's a lot of huh. us here that... Anika, Anika, we're not we're not alone we're not alone in the nation. And I have a question from uh, Teachers for Bernie. Uh, they they want to ask you, Representative, uh, what is your opinion? And do, do you have to deal with lobbyists on a state level? And are what do you think about the whole lobbyist uh, dynamic in Washington? And how do we deal with it? Cool. I, I love talking about lobbyists. Um, like I don't think they get framed in in a in a productive way at all. Like we're we're all cheated by the way that, that the lobbyists get talked about, uh, and we're totally get taken advantage of uh, when we just run with the stereotypes. Uh, and, and so there are all there are good and bad lobbyists. There are lobbyists that I love. There are lobbyists that I that I totally avoid. And there's a difference between lobbyists who are um, um, uh, part of an organization, right? Like so, Planned Parenthood has a lobbyist. It's not that doesn't make them an evil person. Like it's a, someone to rely on. It's the contract lobbyists that are ones that are are a real big gamble. Um, because they're literally lobbyists that will just take someone's money and, and advocate for whatever issues they they are. And, and at the same time, so there's good ones and bad ones to do that. And, I mean, you can take it and run with it however, however you want. But um, the 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 part that I am disappointed in the most and. And you know, I mean, like shame to, to mainstream uh, media is that when when they ask us questions about lobbyists, it's 
entirely surrounded around the idea of gifts that we get from lobbyists, and and it is it's taking advantage of of the issue, and it's literally one of those things of like, look at that right there, so that you don't see everything else, because the the gifts that we get, I mean, and I, I mean, I'm speaking from my experience, you know, I've been doing this for, for three years, and I've been, I knew lobbyists before I got into the legislature, and, and I, I know lobbyists now, and I've gotten to know them a lot better uh, since first meeting them, and uh, the, the gifts don't really mean anything, and, and especially on a, on the large scale side of just the legislature in general, uh, the average le legislator thinks the gifts as a perk of being in office, not necessarily something as a quid pro quo where the, they're exchanging it for anything. Uh, I mean, they're almost offended when they don't get a gift as opposed to uh, to, to, to getting one. But but so the, the gifts are almost irrelevant. Like uh, me, like they make their representative or whoever is getting the gift in service of the person who gave it. Well, well, not even that. I mean, like it, it's that's kind of exactly what, what I want to get at in the sense that uh, when I get a gift from a lobbyist, I don't always even know what lobbyist it came from or what interests that lobbyist represents. Because a, a, a lobbyist can lobby for many interests at, at, at the same time. So if I get a gift from just lobbyist A, it doesn't. I don't connect it with you know the mining industry or or, or, or with that industry. Uh, it's not, and in, in, in it doesn't always translate that that way. Uh, and then you know like uh, dinners and 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 uh, you know and drinks and, and the idea that I'm getting sh uh, showered with all this kind of stuff. Uh, it doesn't. When when any of that, in, in my experience, when that has gone on, there is no talking about legislation at at all. So it's not the kind of thing where it's like they're liquoring you up and like. Making this idea sound awesome, there. That's literally just a ploy to become a friend with you, uh, to to get you to uh, to look at them differently. Uh, so no business is really done around around that. And so the idea that 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 is what the problem is. I mean, like it's it's that's just the flashy thing to look at. It's it's much more intricate than just the gifts that we get from lobbyists. Uh, and then even worse, like when we get tickets to things, like be it sports or if it's and anything, a ticket to anything. Again. It, you don't even know who you're getting the ticket from, and and when you know, like the news will camp out in front of the the arenas and question the 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 legislators as they're as they're coming in. They don't know who gave them the tickets. Uh, like they just said yes to an email, and a ticket showed up on their on their desk. Uh, and the lobbyists aren't there at these sports are, arenas with them. So I mean, we're all done a disservice by the highlighting of, of gifts that we get from lobbyists. The, the the real problem that I have with with lobbyists is that uh, in in and again, I'm speaking to Arizona's. My experience in the Arizona legislature and the structure that we have to live with in terms of how we operate our day-to-day -day basis, but uh, I'm I'm almost um, our our day is almost organized. Uh, like we're so busy, we're so slow staffed, everything is so rushed, arbitrary schedules that, that you know deadlines that mean nothing, so that I'm forced to rely on the lobbyist because because of term limits. Uh, right now, we have no Democrat in the Arizona legislature that has been there for more than six, five, six years. We had one Democrat that had been there for eight years. He took eight years of institutional knowledge with him when he left. The lobbyists had been there way longer than we have. Uh, they're getting paid three, four times longer, uh, more than, than we're getting paid as a, as, a, as a legislator. The lobbyists have their own staffs, their own departments. Uh, hmm. There's 24 Democrats in my caucus. We share a staff. Of eight policy staff, eight, eight, uh, a, we have a lawyer, uh, a one media person that we all share. Um, it's it, we're the game is structured to where when we're done with a meeting, we we rush to go find the lobbyists because they're more often uh, n knowing what's going on. Like they're they're way more of a source of information, especially like if I sit down. With my education policy expert, I rob 23 other Democrats of somebody to talk about education. And not just education, because we don't have such short staff. He was also the guy in transportation. He's also the guy on energy issues. So uh, I, I find it interesting that you almost can't do your job without, uh, without lobbyists. That's yeah. and, and, and that's where the real problem is with, with lobbyists. Like it's, yeah. it's structured to where we rely on them, and that's our biggest problem. So the, the gifts are just there... To, to catch everyone's attention. Uh, I mean, it's it's never in the sense. I mean, they. I mean, even if I get a hotel room somewhere, even if I get a trip somewhere, it's never going to equate to me just taking that person's side on an issue. Uh, the, Do you think that applies to every uh, representative religiously? Uh, I mean, again, it's because they've created a relationship with them, and and that's much more what the lobbyists are taking advantage of. It, uh, like the the. I guess, and again, I'm, I apologize for saying like the average legislator. Much thinks the gifts 
are part of the the job, part of the like job. a part yeah, of the part just of the comes job. with it. But it is it is actually part of the job, I guess. Now it's just that's the way it works. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I have what a do you think we can do about yeah. that? I'm oh. oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, please. Let me just that's ask actually, him this real quick. That's actually what, a great what exactly question. should should we be doing to change that? Um. So we, we for sure we have to to put together the government that we want uh, how we want it to serve us because right now we're getting nothing out of it uh, with the way that it's organized right now. Um, so uh, I mean, like I've looked at um, I've looked at. Uh, information about how the how all the different state legislatures are organized. There, there's not um, there aren't norms that really go across the, the board. Um, and it, 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 yeah, lo, uh, every state is different in, in their own way. Um, but um, we need to address this lobbyist relationship with state officials, and it should be what we're uh, our more important thing because. Uh, the federal government has become so backlogged and like you know nothing gets done that everyone else has already figured out that out a long time ago so that business interests when they want something passed that has a national effect they don't go to Congress anymore they go to Alec and Alec makes their right. bill passed in all 50 states at the same time pretty much uh, mm -hmm. so I mean like there's there, and so we do have to worry about the relationship that lobbyists have with state officials. Like it's it is a lot more powerful right now than than Congress in, in some kind of effects, uh, especially well, on, when you on, look a at, of, on a lot of levels. Local uh, governments tend to have more uh, more you know influence on things you know closer to home. And I so yeah. I think yeah I think lobbyists in that environment are definitely going to have a, a, a stronger effect on what's going on on the ground. So we, we need to have a much more, I mean, I don't want to just say the cliche, like, equal playing field, but, I mean, it needs to be set up to where it's not in their favor, at, at, at least. Uh, so, they, I mean, I think there's probably only, like, ten states that have a full-time government, and that should be shocking. That I mean, I mean, like, we make fun of government all the time, but there really isn't anywhere we're working where there's, like, a full-time government that's there to be looking out for things. So uh, term I mean, limits? So are you for term limits? Is that something? I, you I hate term limits. Term yeah. limits are the worst. I, I think term limits kill institutional knowledge. Uh, they encourage it to where uh, everyone's fighting with each other. Like w w because of term limits, there's so many people who will get into the job and be like, they'll look at everybody and say, there's no reason for them to build a relationship with somebody because that person is going to be gone in, in, a, in another year or two. I'm going to be mm -hmm. gone in another year or two. There's no incentive to build relationships across ideological barriers across anything really um, uh, term limits make it to where the lobbyists have all the power uh, there's yeah. no term limits for lobbyists uh, I mean, you know I'm, we're dealing with the same po uh, energy lobbyists that we've been dealing with forever and that's why right. we have the energy problems that we, that we have um, uh, but um, the other thing that's the problem so we, I mean we need for sure we need full-time government uh, I, I'm scared for how Many governments, state governments, have the level of staffing that, that, that we do. Uh, I mean, like it's it's kind of scary that you expect somebody, uh, even a state legislator, to be able to handle all the decisions that they were given. Um, like you would want us to have a staff. You would want us to spend time on, on, on issues. And so, you know, like everybody needs to be moving to a full time legislature so that we deal with issues throughout the whole year. Well, that doesn't that uh, open another doesn't that open in a whole another window for corruption with uh, you know a career politicians. I mean, no, uh, I, I think the arbitrary deadlines and uh, the forget about arbitrary forget about um, so the arbitrary deadlines rush everything to where it's not in your favor, right? If it was all year long, we'd all be able to take a lot more time. Everything would go a lot more slower. There'd be a lot more there'd be a lot more review. Uh, and then career politicians are not as scary as um, the revolving door uh, idea of politicians becoming a politician just to become an expert on an issue to then right. retire as a, in, in industry. That's and term, way worse term limits, than... Term limits is almost like a fast track into that job. Yes, you know? the term <laughs> limit is just guaranteeing that, that, it, that it cycles through. Right. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's in their favor. Um, what about longer term limits? I mean, that would handle the problem of, of the idea that I, I'm constantly running for, for re-election, right? So, like, I'm on a two-year cycle. I can, I can do four two-year terms in each chamber. Uh, if I had a, a four-year term, that would, uh, for sure, uh, uh, I would imagine, encourage or produce 
a better legislator and that I wouldn't spend my first year worrying about how I'm going to get reelected. And, and because a lot of times, I mean, like I'm watching so many people who rush into this position and and don't question what we're doing. Like they just, you know, they figure out how everyone else is getting ahead and they just try to beat them at that game and don't question if what they're doing is conducive for democracy or you know deliberation or whatever we're doing. Um, so uh, a lot of the environment needs to change around around politics. But I, I mean, I think. Term limits have only hurt us. And you mentioned switch, Alec. Um, sorry, can I just real quick uh, talk Absol about Alec? Because yes, uh, Kathy Harrod, and we have this is a constant thing in Arizona. I mean, they literally write our legislation, right? Yeah. And uh, so there is an, a seepage of that into the government here. And so they, I know they're influenced by it not necessarily through gifts or whatever, but what is the power that is exerted over legislators? How is that power exerted? It's not through the gifts, but how does Alec get that legislation passed? So Alec really is, like, amazing. Like, it's not, like, no matter how much I hate it, I can't talk about, I mean, the, what they're doing is is they've streamlined everything, like lobbying, the, the whole idea. Um and so what, what you're, uh, I mean, it isn't anything nefarious, right? Like it isn't evil. It isn't, uh, you know, like people really necessarily pulling puppet strings. They're taking advantage of just, uh, I mean, like I'd hate to, I'm not trying to disparage people so bluntly, but they take advantage of just laziness. Like it's just so much easier when someone else is doing your job and you're just essentially, you know, you're a lobbyist too. You just pick up their issues and run and, and lobby them at the legislature. You don't have a staff to research for you, to provide you with information, where else are you going to turn? turn to Alec, yeah, right? And so, like, I mean, for the people who don't know what, what Alec is, right, like, it's, 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 it's just a convention, right? Nothing about it is illegal, and that is the scariest part. They're registered as a, as a uh, I forget exactly what status, but it's a nonprofit, like it's, like it's a church, right? So corporations are making donations to Alec. And and they uh, and, and they get to prioritize. They get to write the script, basically. They get to write the script. They get to write the script in front of all these legislators from all yeah. over the country. Um, and, and it's going on like right, like right after, like in the next week, I think is the next uh, Alec in in, in in San Diego. Um, and so the corporations will get together before the legislators get there. They organize the agenda. And, and they just push it on on these legislators, and they give you everything that you, that you need, like uh, from uh, the sample bills to the uh, to the language. And that's not bad. That's I mean, like that's it, I mean, I mean, it's not it's not bad either in the sense that like you expect me to be doing this by myself. Like, so Alec is just a nonprofit that's that's organized uh, it's for their own purposes, like to to advocate for their own issues. And it, it wasn't like before. People started pointing at Alec before, like Common Cause did all, everything they did to expose what what Alec was. Uh, nobody used to think it was a bad idea for like every no, but I mean, no, all the corporations knew what it was. All the corporations were using it. Everybody, like I, I love Google, but Google used to Google used to pay Alec to to lobby for them, right? I mean, because like if you are a business and you want to get something passed and you can't work at Congress, but you want it to work in all fifty states, you pay Alec and they do it for you. Uh, and, and it just used to be so streamlined. Well, that's a little bit discouraging, but so that's what we need to do. Is <laughs> well, that's, why we're, that's why that, we're here. That's why we have the grassroots. Exactly. You know? and, and there's, there's lots lobby. of uh, our own lobbyists. I, I I feel really bad because I'm forgetting their the their names, but there's all kinds of organizations that are trying to do what Alec uh, does for for us on 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 the left. Um, I want to say it's Innovation Six uh, or something. In Innovation State Exchange um, is the one I'm I uh, try to try to start working with. Uh, and I mean I want to have those resources to rely on too. Uh, we all need that uh, to share best practices, to share what's working, how to talk about things, how to frame things. We all benefit from that. Yeah. Both sides, not just one side, though. Yeah. So, totally. Any other questions that you guys have? Nope. Well, we talked about we talked a little bit about incarceration in Arizona, and I want you to try to broaden that a little bit. Just the, the drug war in general. I know the sheriff Arpaio is uh, quite the uh, the front man for. Uh, oh, it's scary there. <laughs> and uh, could you just address that topic a little bit and. Uh, uh, what yeah, is it? so where, where, I just finished this book called. Of, yeah, I just finished uh, this book account. called Chasing the Scream. Chasing the Scream. Oh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, so the, the prison, yeah, the prison industry. 
yeah, it's Chasing the Scream. I just finished this book about the, the drug war, uh, and it, it goes into a, a, little, a little history of, of Arizona, and, and it, I mean, it makes, sure, Joe scarier than I thought he could be, um, <laughs> uh, in, in the sense that he is basing a lot of how his approach to the drug war off of the main architect of, of the drug war. Uh, and so um, the, the, the drug war has always been something that where they're taking advantage of the fear of the population. Um, I mean, it was always a, you know, that is what your problem is, and if we get rid of this, it'll solve your problem uh, kind, 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 of, kind of approach. Um, and, but, uh, but it's already, it's already, I mean, I always... I mean, my optimism is scary and that I imagine it could be worse, but it is as bad as you thought it is uh, in, in terms of from, from what I'm seeing, from what I, you know, my friends are going through, um, we, what, everything that the, the worst people in the world were fighting for when they were fighting for Jim Crow laws and what they were wanting out of Jim Crow is in effect today. In, to a larger scale in a much more organized way than, than even they would have dreamed in, 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 in it, to a perverted scale in the sense that we have large parts of our population, ethnic minorities, who are essentially second-class citizens, right? They, they are restricted from ever voting again. You know, there are certain jobs they will never be able to have. There are certain places they will never be able to live. They are um, ostracized from, from society. Uh, like, they got what they wanted in terms of, of what the Jim Crow laws were, uh, and, and it, so we are in that kind of, of in environment and in, in situation, uh, and and it, it it plays out in a much more you know in your face you know sick kind of way when you see all these prisons and these and, the, and these private prisons and how they've made an industry out of out of, out of, out of doing this right and so and it, it's kind of sick like their model like where where they'll they'll come in and and and, and they'll build their own prison here in, in, in Arizona. They'll pay for it. And and they'll take in contracts from other states and take in prisoners from other states and they'll fill their beds. And then uh, and then, you know, they'll uh, they'll point to where um, you know, like w whenever we think that we need to build another prison, they'll 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 empty their beds when they need to and, and offer them to contract with us for, 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 for their empty, empty beds. So like they move in and build their, their, their markets. Uh, and, and then uh, they get us in these ridiculous contracts where we have to guarantee sometimes 97, sometimes 100% occupancy rates. So, so even if we don't have prisoners, we have to pay for this bed. So it's That's like they guarantee That is they, completely they absurd. They, they perfected like the hotel model. Like I mean, like a hotel would dream of this, right? That's what they would want. Um, they get Unreal. rid of the uh, the fear, and then now they've moved out to where they've started privatizing every other aspect of uh, the, the, the the prison, right? And it was easy when it was the food. It was easy when it was the, when it was the cle the cleaning and stuff like that. But I mean, they've gone down to the healthcare where uh, they they privatize the, the, the healthcare, and then it gets even worse where then they start the you know like they they are cherry picking their their prisoners and they're 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 shuffling prisoners around to where the state now has the most expensive prisoners they're not taking those prisoners when when they you know uh, populate their beds right and so i mean it's causing everybody to have an unhealthy prison system uh, right like if, if the state is stuck with all those unhealthy ones and, 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 i mean i'm sorry i'm, I'm you know i'm saying uh, i don't mean to say unhealthy i just mean you know like if they have to be in the hospital if they have to have you know certain health care um, provided to them. It's a lot more cost. Well, you know, as Bernie says, it's a lot cheaper to educate and get kids jobs than put them into prison. You know? but, but, I mean, their goal isn't to, to, to have them be done, too. I mean, like, we've totally gotten away from the idea of what the prison system was. like it, Rehabilitation? It yeah, yeah. Uh, the, what a that, uh, that whole idea is gone. Uh, because it would destroy their business model, though. Uh, sure, exactly. They couldn't afford to have rehabilitation. That's um, right. So... How do you think that relates to policing? Do you think that, um, you know, the need for us to fill the prison, doesn't that encourage, um, you know, police to kind of go after small things that don't necessarily, uh, violent things, you know, like... Broken window laws. I mean, I, I, I mean, the broken window laws for sure, for sure, but I mean, it, it, it must... 
warp their their outlook, especially if, if I mean if the police are 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 out and about thinking that you know that the prison is the best place for that person, like that means they have written off a lot of that person's uh, potential. Like I mean, it, 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 it the prison system here encourages people to be looked at as as at risk. Right versus what they are as a human being versus their potential. Uh, I mean, it, 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 and it's also hurting our perceptions of ourselves. Uh, I mean, so many times, so many. There are still communities who view, no matter knowing how the prison system is, view it as like, oh, that's what they deserve, uh, or you know, like that's what they have coming to them. Uh, not understanding how it's poisoning us all. Uh, and, and even then, in the in the long run, like we're not going to be able to sustain a prison population like this. Uh, I mean, if, if they're going to be coming out sometime, eventually, like we can't afford to have that many people who are uh, essentially dispossessed from from America. Yeah, and we've so talked a little bit too. about rehabilitation and about how what we can do in order to get that recidivism rate down for offenders. Um, I'm curious what efforts you're aware of, if anything's going on in Arizona, or any models you think that are particularly interesting that are out there uh, currently being used by a state or by a uh, another country that you think that we should. Yeah, no, I, I, I've seen I, I've seen a lot of people. Um, who are organizing around this issue and who are, you know, um, I forget what it's called when you like rely on multiple nonprofits at the same time. Like they're, they're building, um, you know, a, a, like a resource table ar around all, all these, uh, a lot of these people. And, and they've picked uh, the hardest areas to work on. I'm forgetting what the zip codes are, but there are zip codes that have like the worst recidivism rate that, that we know of in our in our in our area. So they're they're highlighting them and and they're doing a lot. To, uh, Service-wise, before people even get out of prison, uh, I mean, and so, so stuff is changing. There are, I mean, there are people who are taking chances on models. I, I wouldn't say the the whole system is is, is taking a change right now, um, but there is potential. But um, I mean, what, what what we need to do a lot more. Um, I want to say like community organizing, so that we as society are prepared uh, to, to welcome people back in. Like, it, it, it can't be this. Uh, this thing where we look down on on, on people like shame is not going to be oh, a healthy way of how we in, integrate people back into in, into, into society uh, and, and and so a bigger issue like I mean when I mean I don't want to try to speak to the effects of what living in a in, in a prison life life is like but I've read some of the things or a bigger underlying problem is we're gonna have to help people rebond. With with all different aspects of society, and so we need to have a society that is ready to welcome them with with all different kinds of things, from jobs to housing to uh, I mean like voting. We can't. I mean yeah, to voting. Yeah, I mean like we can't just uh, welcome somebody back in and and then you know it's get leave them back in a sink or swim situation. Uh, I mean like uh, we have to take response. Somebody has to take responsibility for recidivism. Uh, I mean like when you put somebody out uh, out, out on prison. And they're not able to get a job, uh, or you know, like they have Absolutely. to, uh, they have to live around so many uh, restrictions and make their life work around so many restrictions, and then we just make it harder for them. Uh, I mean, like it's not, uh, you know, they, they can't take advantage of, uh, you know, regular human services like cash assistance or food stamps or anything like that. Like, what do we expect for them to do? Uh, I mean, What's so the recourse? They go back to prison, the, the back in prison. Yeah. So we're we're not setting any good models or any good. Uh, we're not setting any good perceptions for prisoners when they get out either. I, I'm curious, um, Representative. Uh, we've held you for a long time. Do you need to be anywhere? <laughs> uh, I mean, I was going to try to check out. I mean, I'm here to watch Bernie. So are you staying for the Bernie yeah. speech, or are you going to Netroots right now? Uh, I mean, I got the Netroots ticket. So I have one, too. No, right if leave? you want to, it's up yeah. to you. I, I mean, I'll come back, too. Okay, I, I well, you. we'll uh, let you guys go right now, and we'll... Um, We'll just, we'll decide if we want to walk around and hang out here a little bit, and then if you want, we can reconnect later. 
Cool. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start Thanks. getting ready for Bernie. Uh, he's coming up here. Uh, Representative Mendez, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time, and we'd yep. love to have you back later. I want to talk to I want to talk to you a little bit about your secular humanism and the little flap that you created uh, not too long ago. It's an interesting topic for me. But, uh, yeah, thank you. I'd love, I'd love you to go so share much. that. Thank you. Yeah, hope, let's talk. So let's talk some more it. later after Bernie. Aniko, that was okay. great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Enjoy the conference, and we look forward to you talking to uh, some folks there that are supporting Bernie and the representative. And you've done a great job. Our first citizen journalist coming Yay, to us live awesome. from Phoenix. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy the enjoy the speed the talk, and we'll see you soon.